everyone to please turn off all electronic devices so they have the proper kavod, dignity and decorum to the course of Levijah in the course of the service. I'm going to start with the parak of Tehillim. Tehillim Chav Gimel. Mizmar le David, Adonai roi lo exor, Binos desha yarbit zaini ame menuchos yinahaleini, Nafshi yishovev yankein vimagle sedek liman shimo, Gam ki elech begeitz... Begeitz hamavet lo irarak yatoi modi, Shivtecha mishantecha hema yinach amuni, Tarok lefanai shocha neget zoriroi, Ishanta Bashem and Roshi, Kosi Rivoyo, Akto Vokhesed, Yudafuni Koyame Kayai, Bishap Tivesa Dono, Elio Rechyamim. We've gathered here today to pay our respects to beloved husband, father, friend, and I must say on a personal note, Chavrusa, Borach Mordechai, Ben Yakov Aaron Akoi. I remember when I first met Barack, he had moved into town, he and a lot of moved into town, and he came to me and he said he was looking to learn Choshen Mishpat, an interesting section of Jewish law of halacha, section that often studied, and he asked me if I could find him a Chavruta, and I had to be honest, it's a hard thing to find, so I said, Barack, you know what, why don't we learn together? And that started a deep friendship that has lasted for so many years. Barak loved to learn. He loved learning Torah. He was very bright and very sharp. But over the course in time, I got to appreciate him not just as a wonderful chavruta, but as an incredible person. Barak was a man of great passions. The things that he loved, he really, really liked. And he felt them strongly. Whether it was things such as the nature of his love of Star Wars, his feelings about politics. With Barak, he said it like, he, like it was. He was an Ish Emes, a man of incredible truth, a man of un, impeccable integrity. Chazal talk about the idea, rabbis talk about the concept of individual being tocho kabaro, being a man who your insides and outsides, the appearance you put on and who you are internally are in sync. And that's who Barak was. He was a man of incredible integrity. He shared with you how he felt because he believed it from his core. And he couldn't stand things that weren't honest. He couldn't stand things that weren't straight. It went against the very grain of his, of his essence, but the grain of who he was. From the time that I've known him, things have been hard. He's, he suffered through many great usurium the last few years, great physical pain, great emotional anguish, even before that. He had a complicated, hard life. Very, very difficult, challenging life. When I think of Barak, when I think back my years together, I choose to focus on those moments, those images that captured who he was and the way I'll always cherish him. I think of the individual davening and Yom Narayim. If you daven near Barak, from the very depth of his being, he cried out in his prayers, he cried out in his davening. He danced on Simcha's Torah with such fervor and emotion, such love, such a joy, such happiness. And who can forget his blowing of the shofar? At the time, I was running the Kolo Minion upstairs in the young Israel. And Barak, no matter how weak he was, he lived for blowing that shofar. It was what he enjoyed, not just that he enjoyed, it touched his soul. You felt his neshama coming out in every, in every sound that he made, in every breath that he took. He loved his children so deeply. When he first took ill, we were worried if he was going to make David Bar Mitzvah. And he did. And he walked to David Bar Mitzvah. And he walked to get his Aliyah. And he was so happy. Anyone has ever been in the house and seen when Devorah comes home from school and the way she embraced him and the way he embraced her, you saw the unbelievable love of father to his children and his incredible wife, Ilana, who really moved heaven and earth to take care of him for all these years, who pushed him in his darkest moments, and there were many, 
the moments that were very dark. And he didn't want to go on. And Ilana would be there, in his home, in his hospital room, wherever it was needed, saying, Barak, we're going to do this. We can. And we did, time and time and time again. He was blessed with many incredible, incredible friends. And friends who are too numerous to mention, and you don't want to start mentioning in case you forget, but they know who they are. They know what they did for this family. They know what they'll do for this family for all time, because of the eternal bonds that were formed. He always dreamed of going back to the land of Israel. When we were able to arrange that trip for him, and he went with David, he was beyond excited, beyond happy. And he told me when he came back, the only thing that was difficult was returning, because that's where he wanted to be. He lived a difficult, complicated life. And he's finally at peace. He's finally returning to the land of Israel, not the way he intended. But he's having his final resting place there. He's a Baruch. May his memory be a blessing. May all of us treasure, cherish the memories that we had from him, the lessons that we learned from him, the lessons that he imparted to his children, the lessons that will be carried out to all time. May his memory be a blessing. There are many people who we've asked to say a few words, to share different thoughts. I'd like to start by calling up Rabbi Naftali Bernstein of the Young Israel to say a few words. hard to say goodbye to a good friend. I was trying to think of what would be the, the right pusik or phrase that I thought somehow summarized who Barak was. And I thought of the verse that we're all familiar with, or Zeruelat Sadiq Uli Yishrei Lev Simcha. And not to take away from the first half of the pusik describing the Tzadik, but I think, as Rabbi Blau mentioned, Barak was a true yosher. He was straight. There was no shtick. He had strong beliefs. He didn't like when he saw things that were not 100%. And he told you, and he shared it with you. But he also possessed the end of that phrase, simcha. He was mole simcha. Speaking with one of my children today, and I mentioned that Barak passed away, and he says, you know, I remember whenever he'd walk into the shul, he lit up the room his excitement, his enthusiasm, his smile. He remembered the Simcha Torah. He came into the shul. He took over. He literally took over the room. He was, he was the Simcha in the room. That was, that was Barak. Barak decided to go into the bakery business. Now, we would say he did it because he wanted Parnassi. He needed to make a living, and that's true. But I think he did it with a, with a bigger intention. He did it because he wanted to make a difference. He wanted to make his impression. He was going to make it even better. It was already a wonderful bakery. He's going to make it even better. And he was so proud of the recipes that he had come up with that he was going to make things even better and better and better. His love for everyone, his love for the community was so unbelievable. As our Chazal tell us, the goal is obviously not only to love others, but to have such a love that automatically others reciprocate that love for him. And that's what he was all about. During that period of time, when Barack was running Lax Mandel, I must admit, we had some pretty good fights. Some pretty, pretty strong arguments and fights. I remember as I was driving around today once, I don't know why I was there, but I was somewhere in Solon, lost. Driving around, I assume I was using my Bluetooth, I hope I was. And I was on the phone, and we were having this shouting match. But whenever, except for that one time, because I wasn't there, whenever we had those arguments, it always ended with a hug. We always made up. It was done out of love and out of his conviction for MS, for truth. As was mentioned, Barack suffered, particularly in the last few years. And his biggest concern is about his very special wife, Davian Devorah his mother, 
He was so worried and so concerned about them. Barak, I want to ask you, Mechila, for the times that maybe I argued too strongly with you and didn't treat you with enough respect. You were zochet to arichas yomim, not arichas shanim. You didn't live a long life in terms of years, but you accomplished a lot. You accomplished a lot in our community. You touched so many people. You raised a beautiful family. I'd like to close. I had a few moments last night in the room alone with Barack. And I talked, and I hope he listened. And I ended by just saying the phrase, I said, Barak Haveri Lech Bishalom. Barak Haveri Lech Bishalom. His life was a life of shlemus, a life of completion. Our Chazal tell us that when you're t saying goodbye to someone who has many years to go, you say Lech Lishalom. But when you're saying goodbye to someone who's going to his eternal rest, we say Lech Bishalom because we recognize that completion is there, the shlemus, the completion of his life. His life was a life of shlemus, a life of love, devotion. He touched all of us in a very special way. Barak Haveri Lech B'Shalom. Barak Haveri Lech B'Shalom. I'd like to ask you, before I'm Nisim Baum, please come up and say a few words. Much more really that can be said that hasn't been said by the previous Rabbonim. As was mentioned also, Beck was a friend, a friend to everybody that he met. As Rabbi Bernstein mentioned, his involvement with the bakery wasn't merely just for Parnassa. That, that tremendous sense of pride that he had, just speaking with Juan, his, his worker, was welcomed him in the bakery, was with him over the past few days. Also, that, that type of a bond that was inseparable, and he talked together how much, how much the simcha, how much the fact that he was able to bring pleasure to the community, he had a tremendous sense of, of pride in being able to give pleasure to the community. He had a tremendous sense of abbas hachayim, that sense of a love of life. Aside from the simcha that, brought, that, he, that he showed Pastor Yom Toivim and his intensity of emotion. But such a sense, throughout the past few years of his illness, he wanted so much, he fought so much to be able to get better. If it's such a sense of, such a sense of simcha, of being able to be appreciative of the small things that he couldn't take for granted anymore. But he was so appreciative too. Mishnah Pirk Yavis tells us that Yishmo used to say, Vikal, the rush, the noach latishchores, the mekabel is called adam besimcha. A person should be kal. A person has to be flexible, so to say, for greatness. Perhaps a little goes a little soft. A little serious, perhaps tashchores to those who are perhaps younger still. But the mekabel is called adam to greet every single person with simcha with a certain sense of joy. The Benyon explains that. What that means to say is, despite the fact that a certain sense of respect that he had for the rabbis, and he was very involved with the rabbis in Sefer as Ashgacha, and as far as the shuls were concerned, he was involved with on many different levels. There was a tremendous sense of respect that he had for the rabbanim in town. And there was a certain sense also, as was mentioned before, to his friends, perhaps a little bit, a different type of relationship. But they have makabalas called other besimcha, that sense when you came in, when he came in to maybe coming in to visit when he was ill, he was so appreciative of every single visit. What he found perhaps found so moving was a week ago perhaps, when I went to visit him in the ICU, he wasn't able to talk anymore. I was there for a little while talking with him and he was trying to communicate the best he was best he could. And before I left, he voiced, he was moving his lips hard to understand him. He moved a little closer. He just repeated himself a few times. Thank you for coming. 
that sense of a person that was so difficult for him to breathe, it was so difficult, a very difficult time, but such a sense of appreciation for small things. We tried to visit him when we were able to, perhaps it wasn't enough, but he never made you feel guilty. Every time you came, there was a sense of, thank you so much for coming, thank you so much for taking time out. Even I felt a little embarrassed, I probably should have been here over the past couple of weeks, I didn't have a chance to make it over the past couple of weeks. He didn't think about that at all. Tremendous Musr safer, so to say. Tremendous, so much to learn from this person. Person that perhaps is somewhat of a simple person, a laborer. As although he was intelligent and he did enjoy learning very much, that is true also. But there was so much that I felt that I could take away. Sometimes you come to visit a person, sometimes you feel you want to be able to offer something, and you walk away taking away much more than you actually have given. As is mentioned, Barak Lech B'Shalom. Kaddish Baruch Hu, give the strength to your wonderful family, your wife and your children and your mother who are there through the thick and the thin. Kaddish Baruch Hu should be able to give them the strength to be able to continue on to, to keep alive that legacy that you leave over. As you've noted, Iraq formed very deep and powerful friendships. I'd like to call upon Avi Aviv to come up and say a few words. that is crying, it's, it shows the gedula of the nefesh, of the niftar, that someone is, has the ability to cry on somebody else. It shows which kind of person he was. To all the Rabbanim speak, all I can say was Ba'ali Surim G'doyli had Ahavag for Eretz Yisrael, always wanted to go back when am I going to get there? I'm willing to go. Just give me the opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. Sorry. That's where he wanted to get to. Again, Bali Surim Gadol, every time we spoke to him. Ko Adiv, Ko Sameach. Always wanted to help. Everybody has something to be mivkash bakesh mechila. So I mean, I'm asking bakesh mechila that we didn't visit you enough. I was there the, the day when he went in. I was there at the time many of us were. At the first time when he went to the hospital down in Euclid there. And after they did the surgery, he went out and he was trying, he was fighting to live. He wanted to live, he was fighting to live for his family to be Mikhail Mitzvot and at the last time at the last time I saw him that was the first day last time I saw him that I spoke to him he was being Mitzvot that he couldn't be Mikhail the Mitzvot he couldn't Mikhail the Mitzvot that's what he was thinking about with all his Yisuri Ba'al Yisuri and Ava'al Am Yisrael I'd like to ask Ari Jaffe to please come and say a few words. month of Adar is one of mystery. And 
what's considered by many to be a month of good luck. In my own mind, Adar and uh, the double Adars of leaf year in particular, like this year, are a time that really requires all of us to peer behind the curtain, to evaluate if we really understand the whys and wherefores of life, and to look very deeply and very closely and understand the words of the Megillah in which Mordechai asks Esther, who knows if this is the moment that, for which you've achieved royalty. I want you all to, to picture a scene. It's 6.30 in the morning on a weekday a few years ago. Most of us are just getting up. Businesses aren't open yet. Kids haven't been driven to school. And Starbucks hasn't even uh, formed a line. And Barack Bentor has already been at work for two hours. He's standing in Lax Mandel at the doorway between the kitchen and the front of the shop. And he's covered head to toe in flour, particularly his big arms from lifting big 50 pound bags of flour. And he's breathing heavily because he's still in the middle of chemotherapy. But he's smiling because he's been baking. He's been baking for two hours already, and he's doing something that he absolutely loves. I just thought that it was the process of baking. I thought it was the process of making something from nothing, of kneading dough, of watching the yeast rise, of spreading frosting, of making bear claws and almond cookies, and putting chocolate on every possible combination of flour and water known to man. And then not long after, I had an experience. It was getting close to Rosh Hashanah, and Barack was panicked, because the proof oven wasn't proofing. I don't even know what that means, but the proof oven wasn't proofing. And there weren't enough hands in the bakery to make halot. And that was a crisis. My daughter, Leora, and I volunteered. We spent one night making dough, tying dough, spreading egg wash on dough, baking dough, and selling finished challahs. And it was that night that I learned the secret of Barak Bentor. Because it wasn't about the cooking or even the selling. It was about the service to the public. It was about how Barak saw his role in the community. Challah is much more than bread. On that day, I learned that to Clevelanders, challah is life. Erev Rosh Hashanah, Barak was making Jews. People came in from the entire state of Ohio, from truly the western to the eastern border of Ohio in a cluster. They told stories about their parents' homes and their own memories of Rosh Hashanah. They talked about davening and spirituality and repentance and the glow of being a family and the very holy importance of raisins. And as Juan and Stefan made dough, as Lauren ran the counter, as Stanley made deliveries all day long, as Ima ran the back room, as Ilana and David and Devora came and went all night long, and Barack presided over all of it, I had an Adar kind of moment, a chance to see behind the curtain, a chance to see that not everything is as it appears, to glimpse the world of public service by the man who at that time was himself suffering excruciating pain and the agonies of chemotherapy, his own fear of the upcoming Yom Norim, and his own angst about the deepest questions of life itself. But at that moment, Barak was the public servant who only wanted to serve all of us a good piece of challah. Barak and I were brought together by illness and pain. We both love good food, movies, good writing, a good Bar Torah, and especially family. Barak loved his family and was exceedingly proud of all of them. I want to express my sincere and overwhelming sympathies to Ilana, to Devora, to Ima, to Barak's sister, to the entire family. Your husband, your father, your brother, your son was a good man whose deeds were huge, much larger than his body or his words. He was a lesson to all of us. For the last husband, for the last eulogy, I'd like to call up a man who he considered a brother, Adam Price. begin 
speak about <clears throat> my best friend of 17 years. I have a chance to emulate him in being an Ishamus. I had not planned to speak, and Rabbi Blau invited me to speak just about 45 minutes ago. Fortunately, I studied speech communications for several years, and speaking off the cuff doesn't scare me. I'm only scared by a couple of factors. Number one, I don't know where to begin. Number two, I hope I say enough. And number three, I hope I don't say too much that the Olam is chasing me away from the microphone. I guess to begin, last Shabbos Kodesh, August of 1998, I was milling around at the Kiddush after davening at a little shtiebel in Los Angeles. And I simply remarked about how good the Kiddush looked. And this bubbly man slaps me on the back and in a cartoon character's voice, agrees with me on the quality of the spread at the Kiddush. And right at that moment, the two of us were drawn to each other because we realized we shared three predominant things. A passion for Yiddishkeit, a spirit of absolute goofiness, and a spirit of being quite fiery. The spirit of being fiery, of course, led us to fight very often like we were brothers. But of course, what's wrong with that since, except for that technicality called biology, that's really what we were. Think back on a lot of funny, sometimes not so funny, but I want to focus more on the funny and good memories I share with Barack. When David was eight days old, I was asked to carry him on the pillow for his bris milah. What I did not share with Barack or with Alana until everything had gone well was that the night before I had been at a dinner celebrating the bar mitzvah of a Talmud of mine, and I decided to treat the celebration like it was Purim, and I was hung over the next morning. And I can assure you, Barack never let me hear the end of it. Not because he was angry, not because he was unnerved, but because he said that's something that only you could be capable of doing. After several years of living in an apartment building run by a very, very tyrannical and mean man, it was Barack who came over to our apartment and said, there's an apartment open on the floor above us in our apartment building. You better come over, look at it, and sign a lease. Now, when Barack talked, people listened. What else could I do? I went over to the apartment building. I looked at. Uh, I looked at it, I fell in love with the place. I thought, living directly above you know, my big brother, how can we go wrong? And the last two years that we lived together in Los Angeles, we lived one floor apart. Consequently, we spent many Amotzei Shabbos together, many Hanukkahs together, many Purim together, many Pesach Sedarim together, all forming really, really good memories that I know that I will never be able to shake, no matter how hard I would ever try, not that I ever would. As everybody had mentioned before, Barack told it like it is. That can be a little bit of a bad thing when you have a really, really corny sense of humor. But Barack always played into it. I, as he told me one time, he said, you really make me work hard because I have to keep about 10 steps ahead of you with the jokes so that I have something to say back after you say something corny. Barack was somebody who made it really, really clear he would give you his last dime and the shirt off his back. While he was in the heart of running the bakery, my family fell into a bit of a financial strain. But my wife and I agreed, no matter what, we will always support Barack's business any opportunity we have. So one Thursday in March of 2013, my wife sent me to Lax and Mandel to pick up some collars for, for Shabbos. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my wallet and like a Mack truck hitting me, out came Barack from the back, literally trying to whack my wallet out of my hand. And telling the cashier, this is my little brother, there's no charge. It's too bad we couldn't have gotten news cameras over there because the sight of my trying to get my wallet out of his hand and him holding it above his head so I couldn't even reach it was quite a sight. And I think now the fondest memory I hold of Barack was in July of 2014 when I had to travel from Cleveland to North Carolina to bury my mother. 
I posted on my social media page that I needed to be picked up to go to Hopkins Airport at 4 o'clock in the morning, and did anybody have a source for my doing that? About two minutes later, the telephone rang, and I saw it was Barack's number on caller ID. I pick up the phone, I said, hello. I did not get a hello back, I didn't get a hi back, I didn't get a how's it going, I got, what are you, Meshuggah? He says, I'll take you to the airport. I said, I need to be picked up at 4.15 at the latest. He said, yeah, and? He wasn't there at 4.15 in the morning, he was there at 4 in the morning. Fortunately, I was already downstairs, so the neighbors didn't have to hear about it. But before we parted company on the phone, he asked me, what sandwiches can I make for you? And you have to understand that being in rural North Carolina, where there is no kosher food anywhere, that was a very significant offer. So not only did I get a free ride with a smile on the face to Hopkins Airport at 4 o'clock in the morning, I got four ready-made sandwiches to eat after the burial in rural North Carolina. Barack was a true friend. His friendship is something I will cherish and I will never forget. Barack, I can only hope that I was as half as good a friend to you as you were to me. If I wasn't, please be more me. At this point, I'm going to ask everyone to please rise for the Kamale. I'd like to call up a very, very dear friend, Roy Schlovinger, to do the Male. Just before I do the Kelb Mole, I just wanted to leave one very short, and I'll be very brief, message for you, David, Devora, Ilana, and Ima, and his family. A and that is that as um, Barack saw on Friday afternoon that things were not going well, uh, he left me in charge of letting you know in case he wouldn't be able to say it himself. And these were his last words before, this was about a half hour before Shabbos, and he mouthed the words, tell my family and my children how much I love them. Um, and um, there was some, there was a peacefulness about that. But my message to you is that always had you on his mind, in his heart. You always came first before him, and he loved you very, very, very much. Hamitzel, <laughs> Nishmas Barak Mordechai Ben Yaakov Arona Kohen Sheholach Leolomo Bavur Shionachanu Mispalelim Biadas Koras Nishmo Begane den tehe menu chaso Lochene balo rachamim Yasti reu besei sereke no fovli olomim Bitsror bitsror achayim Esenishmoso 
Adonai unachaloso v'yonuach b'shalom al mishkavo v'nomar v'nomar omein May now be seated. This concludes the section of the Levaya. After this point, the family will tear Kriya, and we will all escort, the Nifta will all escort Barak as he begins his travels to Eretz Yisrael, where the Kfur, where the burial will take place. The family will start their Shiva today, as soon as they get back from the funeral. The hours tonight are 7.30 to 9.30, for the rest of the week, 9.30 to 12, 1 to 4, 7.30 to 9.30, they're not Minyanim, at the house, but those are the hours for visitation. Again, he's a Baruch, may his memory be a blessing.